Hey everybody, Rob Mauer here. Welcome back to Tesla Daily. It's great to be back and we've got a lot to catch up on, including news from Giga Shanghai, Berlin, and Texas, a new note from Morgan Stanley, news on FSD beta, Tesla energy, and more. So we're going to hop right into it and we'll start off with the stock, unfortunately not coming back to the best day today for Tesla. The stock down 4.1% today, closing at $288.59. Well, the NASDAQ was down 1.4%, but a lot of high multiple companies today performing similarly. Of course, there was news of a Tesla quote-unquote recall today, but that's an over-the-air update. A very minor firmware adjustment to improve some reactions to object detection when the windows are closing. So it might save some pinched fingers, which is great, but really not a big deal. I don't think the stock reacting too much to that other than maybe some algorithmic trading off of those recall headlines, and maybe that has a little bit of an effect, but to any actual investors, obviously a non-story, and I don't think a major factor in trading today. I think today was more of a continued reaction to the FOMC meeting yesterday. Of course, the interest rate raise, the summary of economic projections release, we'll talk about that in a second, and then some of the commentary from Fed Chairman Jerome Powell himself. So of course, as I'm sure most are aware by now, yesterday the Fed did announce moving the target federal funds rate up by 75 basis points to 3 to 3 and a quarter percent. And Fed Chairman Jerome Powell's comments were not that well received by the market as there was a decline in stocks following those comments yesterday, which seemed pretty similar in tone to his Jackson Hole Symposium comments, really echoing that they are going to continue to do what they believe they need to do to get inflation under control. Powell said, quote, we have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there were a painless way to do that. There isn't, end quote adding that no one knows whether this process will lead to a recession or if so, how significant that recession would be, and quote, the chances of a soft landing are likely to diminish to the extent that policy has to be more restrictive, end quote. That more restrictive policy is exactly what the Fed is expecting as a part of the September meeting. They do release their summary of economic projections. This is something we last saw out of the June meeting. It does include an updated so-called dot plot, which maps out committee members' expectations for target rates by year. On the far left, we can see that committee members' expectations pretty much midpoint around 4.25% for the end of 2022. There are two meetings left, the next one being November 2nd and then one in December. So over the course of those two meetings, the committee is pretty evenly split between a cumulative increase across those by 100 to 125 basis points. This expectation is considerably higher than the last update to the summary of economic projections from June, where the midpoint was somewhere around 3.25%. So pretty much a full percentage point increase and pretty similar for next year 2023 expectations in terms of the increase there as well. And of course, this is a continued rise. June's expectations already had a similar increase from the expectations published back in March. So we continue to deal with a lot of economic uncertainty. A lot of focus will remain on the CPI and PPI reports. And we'll also get the PCE, Personal Consumption Expenditures report, next week. All right, moving into Tesla-specific news, I want to start with a topic that I think is continuing to cause some concern or uneasiness with investors, and that is estimated delivery wait times in China. Late last week, Tesla again reduced some of these delivery windows. Now all vehicles start with the earliest deliveries at one week. The Model 3 across the two trims sits at either 1 to 8 weeks or 1 to 10 weeks. The Model Y is 1 to 4 weeks for the standard range, 1 to 10 weeks for the other two. So the first thing to mention, which we all know, is that we are approaching the end of the quarter, so Tesla is going to be focusing on domestic deliveries there in China, plus we just had the step change in production at Giga Shanghai. Both of these things work pretty dramatically in favor of reducing wait times, so a reduction shouldn't be surprising. It's just a question of, is this too much of a reduction to the point where we should be having some concern about Tesla's demand in China? Despite the inclination that a lot of Tesla investors have to just wave away any demand concerns, I do think it's a valid question. Yes, Tesla can always drop prices and create more demand, plenty of margin to do so, but that will affect future earnings if they do reduce prices. So for me, it's more of a question of profitability, followed by a second question of how Tesla's factory expansion footprint might end up looking in China. More demand increases the urgency of further expansion, less demand does the opposite. I'm not at all concerned about Tesla's ability to find a buyer for all the cars that they make for many years to come. It's more about understanding those things that I like to talk about, demand pockets, and how that might influence decisions that Tesla makes and the financials of the business. So when I look at this situation, a couple more things to consider that are probably less appreciated than something like just saying, oh, they've brought wait times down. First off, on most of these vehicles, we are still seeing a large window that in most cases is running out eight to 10 weeks. That's two, two and a half months. That means that in many cases, Tesla believes that orders that are made today are not going to be able to be delivered by the end of the quarter. Those orders are then going to fall to the back of the line for a while while Tesla exports internationally at the start of Q4. When that happens, Tesla's going to have a month, month and a half, where they're only generating orders and not being able to fulfill those as production goes elsewhere. What happens then? Well, the backlog is going to grow, and we're going to be in the opposite situation that we're in today. 
So point there being that even though the front part of this delivery window is very short, the entirety of that window needs to be considered. I think people are trying to be a little bit overly precise in terms of their interpretation, in terms of calculations being made off of these things on a historically imprecise data point from Tesla that changes a lot for a variety of reasons, only one of which is demand-based. As for demand itself, there are a couple of time-based things that we should be considering here. First off, we should recall that in August, the purchase tax exemption for new energy vehicles in China was extended through the end of next year. We've talked about this, but that was something that was supposed to expire at the end of this year. That's actually a huge incentive. That's 10%. So for the average Tesla, you're probably saving the equivalent of about 5,000 US dollars. I'm sure there is some pool of orders that Tesla has that were just trying to get in before that expired and now feel that they can wait a little bit longer with that extension. So it's something that really doesn't have anything to do with Tesla or necessarily long-term demand that may have contributed to a lower order backlog in an outsized way here in Q3 alongside all those other factors that we talked about. And then in a similar vein, you've also got a lot of rumors, which we've talked about as well, of Tesla being close to introducing a new battery from CATL, lithium manganese, iron phosphate, which could improve the range on some vehicles. So I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that Tesla has probably had some orders canceled or orders that would have otherwise been received deferred because of the extension of the purchase tax exemption. Similar thing with the battery rumors. You combine that with end of quarter and to be honest, a pretty ridiculous step change in production. This is all very important context to consider most of which is not. And this is why I think of things in terms of being demand pockets, because that's truly what they are. There are external factors that drive order rates up or down, and most of the times those end up just being deferred till those factors swing the other way and end up driving orders or increasing the backlog. If you literally graph that out, you would see pockets on that graph. It's the same thing as if you looked at Tesla's stock chart over short time horizons. Do not get confused by those pockets. Now, with all that being said, a couple of things to still consider here for Q3. Tesla on September 16th apparently announced an incentive to receive a discount on Tesla insurance of 8,000 RMB if they signed up for Tesla insurance upon taking delivery before September 30th, so quarter end. That's about 1,100 US dollars, but it is a discount rather than just cash back or something like that on Tesla insurance. So in terms of all the quarter end incentives we have seen from Tesla in various markets over the years, this one is still pretty tame, but it is still more than nothing and that's more than what we're seeing in other markets like in the US, for example. This same article out of China also notes that many industry insiders for some reason are expecting that Tesla would cut prices in October. Maybe that's just because of these wait times, maybe some other reason, but those expectations can feed into demand pockets just like we talked about before. But anyway, the last thing to be aware of there in China is that for the week of September 12th to September 18th, insurance registrations were only 15,856 vehicles. As we can see from Moneyball's tweet here, that was down about 2,500 vehicles from the preceding week. As I've noted before, this isn't a perfect corollary to Tesla sales, but it is something that is maybe a bit concerning for what deliveries end up being for September in China. During the weekend question here, we did have that typhoon. Maybe that disrupted some things. We know it did for the factory, at least for a little bit. Maybe disrupted deliveries or even registrations themselves as well. But if we don't see that tick up for the next week, that'll be a pretty major red flag for Q3 deliveries. All right, so I know that was a lot on China, but I think this is one of the things investors are most keyed in on right now. Tesla's long-term demand is one of the most supporting factors for the stock as it needs to grow a lot, and it has to be able to maintain pretty reasonably strong gross margins while doing that. So any perceived weakness in demand can feed through to the perception of the stock and its valuation at present times pretty quickly. Moving on, catching up on some news from Giga Texas, Tesla on Saturday announced that they had surpassed 10,000 vehicles produced at Giga Texas since the start of production. Unfortunately, we don't know the exact number produced at Giga Texas in Q2. My estimate is right around 2,000 vehicles, so Tesla through September 17th likely producing somewhere around 8,000 in a little over 11 weeks, so on average about 710 vehicles per week. Of course, peak production rates should be a little bit higher than that, and production towards the end of the quarter should have ramped up as well, so hopefully we see Tesla eclipse 10,000 in Q3 alone from Texas as they wrap up production over the last 13 days of the quarter following this tweet. Another update on Giga Texas, Tesla has filed plans to expand the footprint for Giga Texas by another 500,000 square feet or so, about 12 acres. Elon replied to Tesla Roddy's article about this and implied that this would be for Tesla's ecological paradise plans for the Giga factory that Elon has mentioned before. Next is a bit of an update on Giga Berlin. We talked before about how Tesla may be allocating some better equipment from Giga Berlin over to the US in a reaction to the Inflation Reduction Act. Jorg Steinbach, Minister of Economics there in Brandenburg, tweeted that he has talked with Tesla and exposure to Grunheide remains unchanged, particularly regarding car manufacturing expansion plans. The battery factory is completed, internal process modification and prioritization are pending, but the factory is coming. 
I've heard some rumors that Tesla is not actually changing the allocation of any battery production equipment, but even with this statement from Steinbach, I don't think we have anything conclusive on that front quite yet. Next up, we've got a new note from Morgan Stanley today, Adam Jonas. He is keeping his price target of $383 per share and overweight rating on Tesla. This note is primarily about the influence of the Inflation Reduction Act. Jonas writes that, quote, the more we look at the IRA, the more concerned we feel for Tesla's competition, end quote. He mentions a point that I have made before as well and says that we believe that investors don't yet appreciate the sheer magnitude of this bill and believes it could lead to a circumstance where, quote, for the first time since its 2010 IPO, Tesla may soon find itself as a consensus long in the institutional investor community. This has never happened before, end quote. I do think we'll get there. We're on the path to getting there, but I think it'll still take a credit rating upgrade, probably a few more quarters of Tesla's financials just expressing their sheer dominance in that regard. And probably, as Jonas mentions here, some final clarification on how the Inflation Reduction Act is going to be interpreted from some of those qualifications and stipulations. I think right now the stock is really just battling between questions on China demand outlook and inflation, balanced by that tailwind of the Inflation Reduction Act and anticipation of Q3 results. These are the main influencing factors that I'm seeing right now. I think everything else is pretty much noise at the time being, and I would include FSD in that, even though I think we all understand and a lot of people understand that FSD is one of the most important underlying elements for Tesla longer term. I'm just saying that I don't think the development there is doing much to influence the stock at this time. A couple of updates on FSD. It looks like Tesla has started to more broadly roll it out to safety scores of 80 or more. Some of that has been a little bit delayed, it sounds like, for some vehicles, maybe requiring a camera upgrade. Elon responding to Joe Tagmeyer asking about that, saying that that was the case for a few thousand vehicles. Probably not actually the case for Joe, as I think he's already had those cameras upgraded, but passing that along as that may be the case for others. And then a couple interesting things here. Elon noted on Twitter that next month, Teslas will start to speed up a little bit faster when noticing that traffic is going faster. Very excited to see that. That's one of my biggest interventions, I would say, especially if there is traffic. It's just way slower to accelerate and follow than most people are. So I think that will make for a much better experience. Elon also said that, quote, note autopilot slash AI team is also working on Optimus and actually smart summon slash autopark, which have end of month deadlines, end quote. That's really exciting to me too, because we haven't really heard Elon talk too much about smart summon or autopark in a long time. With AI day at the end of the month, maybe that is the deadline. So maybe we'll get some new demonstrations of those features. And then of course, for the Tesla bot, well, we'll see at AI day. All right, last couple of things here. There was a mega pack fire at the Elkhorn project at Moss Landing. That was early on Tuesday morning. That fire has been contained, but PG&E says that it is still under investigation as to what the cause was. We'll keep an eye out for updates on that. And then Tesla has finally added the CCS2 Tesla adapter to the Tesla shop. This has only been available in Korea for some time now, so people have been kind of ordering it from there. So good to see that now available, at least here in the US. Not 100% sure about internationally. All right, that is it for today then. So as always, thank you for listening. It's great to be back. If I did miss something that you want me to talk about, let me know in the comments and we'll try to cover some of those things tomorrow. Until then, you can find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast and we'll see you tomorrow for the Friday, September 23rd episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.